And welcome everyone to this edition of Quarantine Q&A presented by Alabama One Credit Union. I'm Roger Hoover with the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Alabama One Credit Union, they've been voted Tuscaloosa's best credit union and best mortgage lender. Alabama One offers low rate auto, mortgage, and business loans, plus protection for it all with Alabama One Insurance. You can visit any of their nine local branches or check them out online at alabamaone.org. Alabama One, a proud supporter of Crimson Tide Athletics. Hope everyone is doing well. And it's time to talk some football. Last week was the NFL Draft, and we are joined now by our former radio analyst on the Crimson Tide Sports Network, Phil Savage, who is active once again in the NFL as the senior football advisor for the New York Jets. And first of all, Phil, roll tide. It's great to see you. How's everything going? Well, roll tide, Roger. Uh, great to be on with you, and uh, hopefully we'll have some fun with this Q&A. What, a, what an unprecedented time we're living in right now. It sure was, and first of all, right off the bat, for the Jets getting ready for the draft, what have the last few weeks been like having to do a lot of uh, meetings like this and then having the draft be virtual? Yeah, I was actually at Clemson on Thursday, March the 12th for their pro day, when of course that was the day that all the sports really began to shut down from the NBA all the way down to the, to the high school level. And uh, from that point on, everything has been done from home. We conducted all of our draft meetings, all of our interviews. As an organization, we interviewed 350 players uh, via Microsoft Teams. So I think we actually did more work this year in terms of interviews than we would have done in a normal year. But uh, it, it didn't impact us much at all. As a matter of fact, I think our, our meetings were actually a little better because we did not have a lot of uh, in-between chatter. Everybody was very courteous. There were like 28 or 29 people on our calls. So everyone was very, uh, uh, they had good manners, so to speak, in terms of making sure they didn't step all over each other. But uh, one, of the, one of the real benefits, though, honestly, has been the fact that we have been able to, to focus on football, but also be around our families, which is you know, you just typically, I would have been gone three of the last six weeks. And so to be able to mix football and family at the same time has been a huge blessing, I think, for everybody that at least has small kids. Yeah, and you had to like that when you were watching the draft coverage on ESPN or the NFL Network, too. So many coaches, a general manager, surrounded by their families, got even creative in some instances. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think, uh, you know, there are a couple times – uh, where you know we would check in just minutes before the draft started, and you know one on one occasion our GM was just like holding his head, saying, "Hey, there was a full fledged hundred percent game of tag going on with my kids. I've got to get focused." And then our head coach Adam Gay said, "Oh man, the, the hubcaps are off over here. You know everybody's just going crazy." But I, I think honestly, after the draft, the wives were the ones who were most appreciative that it was over because, as my wife said, she said she felt like she had been guarding the Alabama for the last three weeks in terms of the meetings and then the draft itself. That's pretty funny. Well, uh, it wasn't long for Alabama fans to hear uh, former Crimson Tide players have their name called. As you look at the first 15 picks of the draft, four were Alabama players. And I'm sure for you, that's just another testament to the program that Coach Saban has built and the talent he continues to bring in year after year to Tuscaloosa. Yeah, it's just another another uh, chapter, you know, coming to an end, so to speak, for these Alabama players uh, to not only be drafted but then move on to the NFL. And you know, now it's an annual situation where Bama has multiple first-round picks. They did it again this year with four, and of course, the the cherry on top was Tua Tonga Valoa being the first first-round quarterback during the Nick Saban era, and. You know, I think everyone had fingers crossed that it would work out for Tua, and that certainly did. Certainly did as he went to the Dolphins with the fifth overall pick. And uh, for you, when you were starting to evaluate Tua or just taking a look at what an NFL team may think about, uh, how much did the injury play in, do you think, the Dolphins' decision and then kind of where they were looking and seeing if he would fit even with the injury he suffered last November? I think that the injury situation was one that really – was the, the prevailing theme for Tua's evaluation. Look, there were several years of tape out there on him. Everyone recognized that he has quick eyes, a quick arm, quick feet. You know, he was so advanced when he got to Alabama in terms of his instinctive flair is what the term that I used to describe Tua when, when he arrived in Tuscaloosa. And, 
you know, I think without the injury, he clearly, he and Joe Burrow would have been right at the top of this draft. I think it did play a factor in, in some teams having some trepidation about, you know, his long-term career in the NFL. But uh, the Dolphins had three first-round picks, and they needed a quarterback. And I think he really goes into a good situation because they've got Ryan Fitzpatrick, who's the, the savvy veteran that can carry the uh, carry the water for a year, and if Tua needs more time to rehab, more time to strengthen his overall body, then he'll have that opportunity to do that. When an NFL team drafts a quote-unquote franchise quarterback, for you, what are the most important pieces to get around him early to make sure he's set up for success? Well, I think probably the first thing is the offensive line, and you know we saw the Dolphins do that. They drafted a couple of offensive linemen early, and obviously that means that they're going to grow together and you know it's one thing about trying to draft spectacular wide receivers and they certainly can help a quarterback but if you don't have the line and the protection then really you're not going to get anywhere because it's not seven on seven it's full-fledged 11 on 11 and you know the teams that do the best jobs of protecting their quarterback are typically the ones uh, that have the most success and i know you know even with our uh, jets team you know, last year we had a lot of struggles up front with our offensive line, and that, that really led us to the first choice we made with the Mackay Becton from Louisville because we, we feel like we have a quarterback in place in Sam Darnold. Bama fans would remember him because he actually came into the game when uh, Bama opened with USC a number of years ago uh, out in Arlington at Cowboy Stadium. And, you know, Sam needs – protection and so hopefully we've been able to do that and I think the Dolphins are on somewhat of a similar path now that they've taken Tua. And the next pick for the Crimson Tide was right before the Jets had their selection at Jedrick Wills going to the Browns so I'm sure you guys liked his skill set and liked everything he could bring to the table. You know we spent a ton of time on Jedrick no no question about that and you know from the, the moment really during the season you know he was a junior that was expected to to come out or at least strongly consider it so you know all 32 teams did a lot of homework on Jedrick and you know he was a player that it, at least in my view he really his status grew over the last nine months I mean I, I think when when scouts showed up there in August they may have thought he was a, a first or second round draft pick but at that time I don't think anybody suspected that he would be a top 10 choice and ultimately through the season that he had than what he did at the Combine and really through the interviews. You know, he's a very likable individual and seems like he's someone that really wants to be a good NFL player. So uh, the, he, he went number 10. We picked number 11. And, you know, one of the interesting things is he's always played right tackle in high school and college, and the Browns are going to try to move him to the left side. And, you know, the O-line coach there at Alabama, uh, Kyle Flood, uh, he believes that, that Jedrick can make that transition. So that's going to be something to watch as he moves into the NFL. But a, a terrific player, no, no question about it. And then right after that, we saw two wide receivers go off the board of former Alabama players. You have Henry Ruggs III going to the Raiders, and then just a couple picks after that, it's Jerry Judy going to the Broncos. And I'm sure for talent evaluators looking at what they did with Tua, just, you had to be really excited to see what they could do at the next level, especially with the speed of Henry Ruggs. Yeah, I think uh, Henry, you know, everyone knew he could run, and, you know, he obviously verified that when he ran the 427 at the Combine. And, you know, you can't coach speed, and I think ultimately that's the reason, you know, why uh, he went to the Raiders. They've always been a team that's been enthralled with speed, so they take him at, at number 12. And then, of course, Jerry Judy uh, goes to the Broncos in the same division, and they're trying to add some weapons to Drew Locke, who was the Missouri quarterback from the SEC. Uh, you know, Jerry is a, is a terrific talent, a, a well-rounded player. We talked a lot about those two guys and C.D. Lamb and you know this was a receiving class that was loaded with talent and uh, obviously they all have their own strengths and weaknesses but uh, there was no doubt that Henry Ruggs and Jerry Judy were going to go high and I mean you know you look at Devontae Smith for next year and then uh, uh, Jalen Waddle, who you know probably will be in the mix at some point in the future I mean Bama could conceivably have four first round wide receivers all on the same field at the same time here the last couple of years. 
It's really exciting and goes to show the talent that is in the SEC. Were you surprised at all that once again this was a very SEC heavy draft? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, between Bama and LSU and, and, and Auburn to an extent, if you, you could have done 80% of your scouting, it felt like, at least in the first round by going to those three schools alone. And, you know, fortunately with me living down in Fairhope, I got a chance to go to all three. So, you know, you get to make a lot of comparisons and, you know, really contrast the players at those three programs. And, you know, I, as I've said, you know, for many years, once Nick Saban arrived at Alabama and began to it really elevate not only the recruiting, but the evaluation of players, I, I think it rose the level of all the teams across the league, especially in the SEC West. And, you know, we've seen the uh, the results of that with the talent that LSU has produced, Auburn, uh, even, you know, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, they've had their share of first and second rounders, Texas A&M as well. So, uh, it, it's it's made the the entire league stronger because of really what has transpired in T-Town over the last dozen years or so. I think so many casual fans mostly pay attention just to the first night of the draft or the first round. But for you and working in an NFL front office, what are those next two days like? Because so much of your team is built during the second round through the seventh. Yeah, it's really interesting, Roger. You know, after the, I would say the first 40 to 50, maybe the first 60 picks of the draft, it's obvious that the 32 teams really have differing opinions on the remaining players because the, the draft board seems to go all over the map at that point. But one of the one of the new newer features of the draft now is that after the first round, you have you know a night and almost a full day before the second and third rounds, and so you can really you know, shift your board around, raise some players up or down, depending on what you took uh, in the first round. And it gives you a chance to strategize, like who you think was is going to be there in the second and third round, maybe even into the fourth round. Of course, the same thing happens after Friday night and you go into Saturday mm -hmm. with the fourth through seventh rounds. But, you know, the thing that, that was really impressive about Alabama's uh, draft class this year is the fact that they had nine players taken but all nine went in the first three rounds. So, you know, these were primo players in terms of, of what the NFL thought about uh, all the guys that were taken uh, in on the first two nights of the draft. Uh, you know, just unprecedented. I mean, it seems like every year there's another record broken uh, by the players and prospects that are coming out of Alabama. Yeah, and there was a lot of thought that maybe a safety Xavier McKinney would also be a first-round selection. Did, could you see anything to where you thought he may become the second-rounder he ultimately ended up being? Yeah, you know, I can't explain that one. I really thought that uh, that Xavier would have been a first-rounder. You know, typically, you know, safeties, for whatever reason, their value has, has sort of slipped in years past, in, in recent years, I should say, where – you know, safeties go in the back half of the first round, top half of the second round. And we, we saw a similar situation happen with Landon Collins, uh, who I thought was a first round player. He ended up going early in the second round to, ironically enough, the New York Giants, who ended up taking Xavier uh, the other night in the second round. But I think it's more of a function of, of position value than the actual talent. Because, uh, you know, most of the people I talk to and I know in our own meetings, we, we really thought highly of Xavier McKinney. Well, anyone else from Alabama's draft class that maybe uh, kind of snuck in under the radar on the second and third days of the draft in your eyes? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that any of the, the Bama guys uh, sneak under the radar. I mean, it, it's, it's a school that is scouted heavily. Yeah, I, I would say from the moment the doors open in August all the way through, you know, in a typical year, all the way up through the, the day before the draft in terms of conversations and interviews. I mean, I know that with Kyle Flood, he and I worked together at Sirius XM for a season on the College Channel, and I texted him the day, the day of the draft to say, hey, you know, what are your thoughts on Jedrick Wills going from right to left? And, you know, that that is that's one of the things that, that Bama and under Coach Saban has really done They've made their people accessible, and they've made their program scout friendly to the point where other schools have had to be more open you know, with their information and, and more open about their evaluations. And I think that really has, has sort of set a standard across college football because you know, 15, 
15, 20 years ago, Roger, most people don't realize this, a lot of schools would be closed on certain days. You could only go to practice at certain times. And, you know, under Nick Saban, it's always been wide open. And I think that that has opened the, the doors to most of all the major colleges because, you know, they don't want to be the, the outlier. They want to be right in there with what happens uh, at Alabama in terms of it being a, a great school call for the NFL. And, of course, you understand why Alabama is, of course, so important, uh, having been the radio analyst on our broadcast for nine seasons. Uh, let's take a step back for a second. First of all, what led you to that position, getting to work with Eli Gold? Well, it's kind of a long story to some extent, but uh, I had been the, the general manager of the Cleveland Browns from 05 to, to 08, and I had gotten fired at the end of December in 08, so now it was January 09. And I had an event with the Red Elephant Club during Senior Bowl week uh, here in Mobile. And it really went well. And I talked about the players that were coming out from Alabama and, you know, this, that, and the other. And so as I was leaving the parking lot, I I tell this story because I'll never forget it. As I'm leaving the parking lot of that venue, it dawned on me that Bama had used uh, an interim analyst on a weekly basis the, the season before. And so I said, you know, I should call Coach Mal Moore because I'd known Mal when he and the Gene Stallings group came in. I was part of the Bill Curry staff on the way out. But I got to stay probably about six weeks in the interim. And Coach Moore and I actually became quite friendly during that time. And we had stayed in contact over the years, especially when I would visit Alabama to scout their players. And so I called him the next day and he said, you know, that may not be a bad idea. He said, you know, you know Alabama, you're one of us, you've always, you know our team, you know our players. He said, most importantly, you know our coach, because I'd worked with Nick Saban at the Browns years ago from 91 to 94. And so he said, I'll get back with you on it. So I would say probably six weeks passed, and I had come up there to go to a spring practice. And I walked down to Coach Moore's office. He said, hey, I've been trying to get in touch with you. And I said, you have? He said, yeah. He said, you know, I've been thinking about our phone call. He said, why don't you do the A-Day game with Eli and the crew coming up in in the middle of April? And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So I can tell you, Roger, I prepared for that A-Day game (laughs) as if it was the Super Bowl of all Super Bowls. On the way to T-Town on that Friday before the game, I, I I had my brother on the phone, and he would he would test me as far as like the depth charts for the for the crimson and the white team the red and white teams and i could give him like three deep four deep at every position and so i was way way over prepared for it and uh did the game and had met with eli the night before and tom roberts and and the whole group and then uh about i'd say probably about two weeks after the 8a game is when jim carabin called and said hey would you want to do this for this year for this year And I'm like, I would love to do it for this year. And I honestly, at that time, thought it would probably be just a one-season type arrangement, quite honestly. And uh, one thing led to another, and it ended up going for nine years, some of the most glorious years in Alabama football history. Uh, I enjoyed absolutely every minute uh, of it, especially the games. And just the fact that, you know, we got to go and cover the Tide not from coast to coast. I mean, that first national championship under Nick Saban in the Rose Bowl against Texas. I mean, that's classic. Then you end up in Miami against Notre Dame. I mean, that's classic. Then the rematch with LSU in between at the Superdome, and then obviously the Georgia, the Georgia championship uh, in Atlanta, and then Clemson out in Arizona. Uh, I mean, we covered it from coast to coast. And what one of the funny things about this whole quarantine situation is that the local station here in Mobile, the Sports Channel, they've been replaying some of the Bama games on Saturdays and Sundays. And to turn the radio on and and hear those games, I mean, it takes you right into, like, the situation that you were in and you remember exactly (laughs) what happened, you know, with Desperation Block against Tennessee. That was one of the games they played a few weeks ago. And, uh, it, that that experience brought a lot of joy to, to me and our family. And like I said, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, I really, really had fun calling those games. And I miss, do, I miss radio, but at the same time, 
uh, you know, I had the chance to go be a GM again with the Alliance of American Football, and I felt like that some of the events were going to interfere with the season, and I didn't want to be a GM for one team saying, well, wait a minute, i got to go call this college game, you know, before the thing ends. And so uh, it worked out well. And then, of course, once that league folded, I got a chance to go to the New York Jets. And I, I couldn't be uh, more thrilled with being with the Jets, not only back in the NFL, but the general manager, Joe Douglas, is one of our former scouting assistants or scouting interns from the Ravens under Ozzie Newsom uh, back in Baltimore from 20 years ago. And so for him to give me a chance to be part of this, it's just been, it's been an absolute thrill this spring I couldn't be happier and you know while I missed the Bama games I did get to go to a couple of them here the last few years and obviously I've, I've made the school call uh, over the last uh, year or so in terms of visiting Tuscaloosa and, and staying in touch with the staff and all. Well we certainly have enjoyed the Radio Classics replays and coming up next is the uh, BCS title game against LSU that will be aired coming up on Saturday. Uh, you mentioned how much fun it was for you working on the radio side. What was it like on a game day sitting next to Eli Gold as he is calling the game because he's someone that is super organized, has the big chart. Just what was it like getting to work with him uh, each game? Yeah you know Eli and I we hit it off from the very start and ironically enough about a month before that story happened where I would gotten relieved from my duties at the Browns. Eli actually called one of our games and it was the most, it was probably the worst NFL game I've ever witnessed. It was the Browns and the Texans, I think. And I mean, it was like nine to six or something. And so, you know, when I re got reacquainted with Eli in 2000, that, that following spring in 09, I'm like, I hope you don't judge me off that one NFL game. Cause that was the worst game I've ever, ever watched. It felt like, but we hit it off from the, from the very first time we started talking about like how it worked. And I mean, he told me two things, Roger. He said, number one, he said, you know, he goes, I'm going to call the play and all. And he goes, as soon as the ball hits the ground incomplete or the runners tackled, that's your cue to take it. And he said, you'll have it until they break the huddle and come back to the line of scrimmage. So he told me that, and then the other thing he said is that, look, it is radio. He goes, if I ask you a question, you've got to answer it. You can't just nod on the radio. And I'm not kidding you. We never met one time after that. We just had a chemistry in terms of when he was talking and, and how I could, could, to, could spin off of that and then some of the things that I could say would relate back to, to how he was going to call uh, the next player, what have you. And uh, Mike Tarico is a, a longtime friend of mine. I saw Mike during that spring of 09. I said, hey, I think I'm going to get to call uh, Bama football this next fall. And he said, well, you're with a real pro. He said, Eli will always set you up. And I can honestly say, Roger, in the nine years we did it, he always set it up where I could then expand on whatever the situation or the circumstance was. And, you know, to, to work with a legend in, in the broadcast world like Eli was a, was a huge blessing. And I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. It was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, we had such an amazing crew with Tom Roberts and, and Chris Stewart and then Tom Stite behind the scenes. And then Brian, Tom's son did all of our stats and, um, uh, you know, just just was really a, a a lot of fun those years, and of course the winning always helps. So <laughs> it certainly does. It's not doing a lot of that during <laughs> during that uh, during that run for sure. Well, and also during that time, uh, you worked with the Senior Bowl in your hometown in Mobile, and we're live on our Facebook page right now. And Griffin writes in; he wants to know who was the best player you saw during your time when you worked with the Senior Bowl. Oh wow! Well, you know, we had we had two players go number one overall from the senior bowl during my time there eric fisher a lineman from central michigan and then baker mayfield went number one my last year but i think honestly the best the most impressive guy that showed up there was carson wentz who went number two overall to the philadelphia eagles you know he was from north dakota state and i mean he he came in to Mobile and the hotel and the meetings and on the field and I always described him I said he's a small school prospect he's a big school prospect wrapped in a small school uniform because if you had put an Ohio State or an Alabama or, or Florida State helmet on his head 
people would have said, oh, yeah, that guy's going number one overall. But because he was from North Dakota State, he had to cover a lot of ground to prove that he belonged at, at that elite status of where he was taken number two. And he absolutely did that. I mean, he's just he's a class act and just you know, just really a good player and came from a great program. I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with North Dakota State, but they're the Alabama of the FCS. I think they've won like eight national titles in a row. <laughs> yeah, college game day now really enjoys getting to go there. Uh, we'll start to get you out on this. Uh, obviously, this is an unprecedented time with the COVID-19 pandemic and students not being on campus here at Alabama. Just knowing Coach Saban like you do and knowing the steps he will take to prepare a football team for whatever the schedule could look like next fall, whenever the next games are played, what's going to be most important for this Alabama football team moving forward, making sure that during this time they are getting prepared for whatever is next? Yeah, of course, I think, you know, this this quote downtime, you know, can't be that for Alabama's team. I mean, these guys have got to be working out individually. And of course, you know, the, the staff is monitoring all of that with the Apple watches. There was a big story about right. that a few weeks ago, which I think now every school in America is doing it that way. But, you know, I think what whenever the green flag drops for you know, college football, whether it's on time or delayed or perhaps mush, push back later in the fall, you know, that's when they've really got to assess, okay, where are we as a team from a conditioning standpoint and then also from a mental standpoint? And, you know, I would say that all of the schools, not only Alabama, but they're going to have to really adjust, say, you know, we want to put the whole playbook in, but the truth is, in this 2020 season, we're going to have to probably, you know, reduce it down some and, and play to our, our players' strengths and try to dial back some of their weaknesses because we're just simply not going to have enough time. They, you know, they're, they're not going to have spring ball. They're not going to have two-a-days. It'll be really interesting. The word that has been used to me the most Roger, by people in the college world, is that everyone's anticipating a modified version of this season. And that means the practices, whether there's going to be sort of a pre-camp time frame, training camp, and then, you know, is it is it 12 games? Is it 10 games? Is it just conference games? I don't think anyone knows at this point what's going to happen in that regard. But uh, as I as I wrote the, the title of my book a number of years ago, Fourth and Goal Every Day. That's what it'll be for Alabama. They will be absolutely ready and prepared to go better than probably most any school in the country. Well, Phil, we have really enjoyed this past half hour just getting to catch up, get some thoughts on Alabama's players in the draft and also your time here as a radio analyst. We certainly miss you in the booth at Bryant-Denny Stadium on Saturdays, but we're glad you're in your role now with the New York Jets. And just thank you so much for your time today. Really enjoyed this conversation. Well, I appreciate it, Roger. Roll Tide, and uh, hope all of the, your listeners and watchers and fans, Facebook fans, are, are all staying safe out there. Absolutely. Roll Tide, Phil. Thanks, Roger. Roll Tide. All right. That was Phil Savage. We certainly appreciate his time. We'll have another Radio Classics interview coming up tomorrow as we continue to give you coverage on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Thanks for watching, everyone.